Good morning, everyone. Good morning. No, we've got a few stragglers still on the way, but we want to uh, go ahead and get started. We've got a lot to cover this morning. Um, let me all let me officially welcome you to the Pinnacle Awards Innovation in Pharmacy lecture. Um, we're delighted this morning uh, to have Rosemary Gibson, our Category One winner recipient, I should say. Um, want to also thank those of us, those who are joining um, online via Facebook Live. Today's lecture will be available on our Facebook page, the Foundation's Facebook page, and on the Foundation's website for those who would like to share this lecture with others or access it after this morning. We'd like to give special thanks to our sponsor, Merck, uh, for making this morning possible. Now I'd like to introduce today's lecturer, Rosemary Gibson. Last night, Rosemary, as I said, received the Pinnacle Award for Individual Career Achievement, and we're thrilled to have her here this morning to deliver her lecture titled Our Medicine Chest. Rosemary is the Executive Director at the Hastings Center and Perspectives Editor at JAMA. Throughout her career, Rosemary has addressed timely and salient patient safety issues. She is author of China RX, Exposing the Risks of America's Dependence on China for Medicines, and the title, Wall of Silence, The Untold Story of Medical Mistakes That Kill and Injure many, Millions of Americans, as well as many other books and articles and, behind, and has been behind the scenes to help shape our healthcare dialogue. Rosemary's career has been dedicated to enlightening exploration of patient safety issues. Let me now welcome Rosemary Gibson to the podium. Good morning, everyone. It is really, really delightful uh, to be here. And I just want to welcome those who are watching this by Facebook. Hello. Uh, we're delighted that you're joining us also. I want uh, all of you to know that it was such a delightful evening last night. I see this place as almost like family now. That the work that you do and your focus on patients and patient care is really extraordinary. And now, as I said last evening, we have another challenge for us about safety, a new frontier, and that is about the medicines that we all rely on and ensuring that every pill, every patient, every time is what it should be. So uh, we'll get started here, and then we'll have lots of time for questions afterward. I really want to have uh, dialogue here and enjoy that, because we all, I think we're all in the process of learning together about this uh, new emerging situation that we're seeing about where our medicines come from and what does it mean? And really thinking about not just prescribing, dispensing, or administering medications, but where are they made and how are they made? A lot of things we've taken for granted. We need to start going up that supply chain and learning a little bit more about that. So I hope today's lecture will be an opportunity for us to think about that. As pharmacists, you're all about patient safety, and patient safety is all about trust. Trust is everything. And I'm motivated in so much of the work that I do in realizing that the millions and millions of patients every day, they're betting their lives that we get it right. Every person, every pill, every time. And how much goes into that to assure it is extraordinary. That's our obligation as professionals uh, to help patients get the right care every person, every time. Been an increase in drug recalls over the years. It's quite profound. And in the news, there's a question about carcinogens in Zantac. Valisher, an online pharmacy, tested products in part because the co-founder's daughter was prescribed the product. And they're an online pharmacy, and they test everything before they sell it. What a concept. That's probably what we should be doing. And it doesn't cost that much. Now, there's been a lot of media reports about this, about the carcinogen in Zantac. And I'll show you these media reports. But I just heard from Valisher early this morning saying, the carcinogens were not in the product. 
but it's how the body metabolizes Zantac, where carcinogens become present. So you as pharmacists will have a far better understanding of that than I. This is uh, Valisher and their homepage, and I have no financial interest with them. I just think it's fascinating. They're a startup on the Yale Science Campus started by two young leaders and who've had one of them uh, started the company because he was taking medications for an illness and something just didn't seem right. So now with their training, they're hiring people who are testing. They uh, put a petition, citizen petition to the FDA and you can read that very small print there, raising their concerns about uh, Zantac and generic products. Concern about the level of carcinogen. Again, they clarify that it's not in the product, but more in how it reacts in the human body. Valisher shared its results with the FDA. It called for a recall of all products generic and brand. And this is from USA Today, and the FDA doesn't want to create panic, understandably so, not to worry. And Janet Woodcock said very clearly, we're going to make sure that it's not in there. And I think of the heroic efforts that the FDA does every day to deal with products from a global market in an increasingly challenging environment. So we have to help make their job easier to ensure quality medicines are what's in on our pharmacy shelves. So how did we get here? That's the subject of three years of really tough research to figure out what's going on in where our medicines are being made. What were the factors that created uh, the present situation? This is a schematic showing the transition that's taken place from the 1980s about the global supply of active pharmaceutical ingredients, chemical intermediates, and raw materials. And back in the 80s, the US, Europe, Japan, they were the primary producers and they sold to the world. Fast forward to now, because of China's very smart industrial policy, they have a plan and they put investment to fulfill that plan. China now is a dominant supplier of the raw materials, chemical intermediates, and APIs for thousands and thousands of medicines used around the world. It's quite a feat what they've been able to accomplish with their industrial policy and commitment. But when we centralize the global supply chain in a single country, whatever country it may be, it really poses challenges with, with a long supply chain and supplying the whole world. I was saying earlier, would we ever put, have all of our global oil supplies in a single country? Probably not. We would diversify just because of recent events of what happened with the facilities in the Middle East uh, being now taken offline because they were attacked, it really goes to show the importance of a diversified manufacturing base around the world. This was a headline in a trade newsletter that really caught my attention from 2012. Dangers aside, drug makers can't live without Chinese APIs. It's really quite remarkable. And then you can see the challenging position this puts the FDA in when it's trying to regulate um, and, and enforce standards when the market is moving in this direction. So this was hidden in plain sight. One of the fascinating discoveries while writing China Rx is how did we lose the ability to make penicillin or lose our facilities that make penicillin? The last penicillin plant in the U.S. closed in 2004. Now, how did that happen? Because China had a plan. They invested heavily in infrastructure. And but it was more than that. And it, this is not just normal trade deals. This is not just about uh, currency and lower labor costs in China. 
there was really something else going on here. And these are uh, slides from a wonderful group in Europe, the European Fine Chemicals Group, and a very public-spirited uh, gentleman, Chris Oldenhoff, who worked in the industry for many years, is now retired, was very gracious to share them with me when I was researching China RX. And look at the subtitle. A 25-year landslide in the manufacturing business of active pharmaceutical ingredients in Europe during that period, 1980s to 2008. And again, it wasn't just mar regular market forces and lower labor costs and less regulation in China. There was something else going on that the following slide reveals. Now, this is a really busy slide, so I'm going to uh, go through it carefully. The bar graphs show global domestic, global production of penicillin. And you can see it going up. Then you have the subset, the smaller bars. That's the result of China's incredible investment in penicillin fermentation capability. And their global production as a share of the total. You see it in those sort of bluish purple bars. That's really increasing as the years go by. I think that's up to 2007, 2008. But very importantly, look at that yellow squiggly line. Not sure if I have a pointer here. And you, that's price. And look what happened in 2004 to price. That's when China lowered, dramatically lowered the price of its product. And it kept it low for several years. And during that time period, all the US, European, and even Indian producers of penicillin raw material went out of business. This is how we got to a very narrow, centralized global supply chain. This is why we don't make penicillin and other generic antibiotics anymore, because we don't make the raw materials, because of what I call the penicillin cartel. What's the cartel? You have a handful of companies, and they control the price in order to gain market share. And that's what happened here. The same playbook was used for something common that I'm sure many of you take. I know I do, and it's vitamin C. There's unequivocal evidence. There was a court case. It's the vitamin C cartel court case. The same thing happened here. A handful of Chinese companies got together and they agreed to fix prices of vitamin C, the ascorbic acid, to the United States and to control the supply of product coming to the country. And what that did was the same thing. This is why we can no longer make ascorbic acid. India doesn't make vitamins. There's one, I found one plant, one tiny plant in New Jersey that makes very specialized ascorbic acid. And there's a small plant in Europe, again, very specialized. But it's this vitamin C cartel. And this evidence came out in a court case started by a group of US companies, not pharma companies, but animal feed companies, because animal feed companies, they put vitamin C in their food for animals. And they, um, uh, formed a class action lawsuit against a handful of Chinese companies. And this, this gets into, it's fascinating how our medicines, we look in our world, but so many other factors now are coming into play to explain why our medicines are coming from where they come from. So I'm going to take a minute, and here's this legal case. So a jury in Brooklyn saw the evidence and said, this is a clear-cut case of antitrust violation, and they put $150 million fines on the Chinese firms. In fact, the Chinese firms didn't deny that they fixed prices and control exports. That case and that decision was appealed in a federal court in New York. And the Chinese government came in and said, well, yes, we required our companies as a matter of Chinese law to fix prices 
and control supply to the United States of ascorbic acid. That's a game changer. The Federal Appeals Court ruled actually overturning the lower court decision and they said well we cannot expect the Chinese companies to abide by their law and US law which conflict at the same time. So in the interest of international comity we're going to overturn the lower court jury verdict on what was clear a, clearly a violation of US antitrust law. The legal case continues. It wasn't until a year and a half ago that it went to the US Supreme Court with the support of the Justice Department. And the Supreme Court reviewed the case and they sent it back to the lower court saying you need to go back and look at this and not put so much credence in what the Chinese government said that it was a matter of law. That was a year ago and we're still awaiting that decision. And I share this with you to show this is what's happening to our medicinal products. This is why, in part, we are in the situation that we're in. This is why we have virtually no manufacturing capacity to make generic antibiotics for common conditions. And I got this information from crowdsourcing it from people in the industry who were very generous and said, yeah, I asked uh, somebody who works in a big company with uh, antibiotic fermentation plants in China. I said, do you know of any generic antibiotic fermentation plants in the U.S.? And this person said, I can't think of any. Somebody found one outside of Chicago. So I think, and what we can do with that information is it's really good for policymakers to know that we don't have the capacity to make really important medicines for the population. And this is globally. Even India can't make its antibiotics without the starting material from China. How dependent are we if China stopped exporting ingredients to the US within three months, all the pharmacies would be empty. That's from Guy Vilax from Hovion. And this is very much like the rare earths. Have you been following the rare earth situation? Where China gained a dominant 80% global market share for rare earths, these really important metals that are used in cell phones and hybrid cars and wind turbines. The same strategy was used with our medicines, controlling the core ingredients. But as you'll see in a minute, now they're moving up the value chain and they're making generic drugs and some of them are being sold here in the US. I was When I first uh, started reading about this, there was the India and China control 80% of the active ingredients in our medicines. But then when I realized that India depends on China for about 80% of the chemical intermediates for the APIs it uses, that was a game changer for me. So I change it to now China controls about 80% of the key ingredients in the world's medicines. And unless somebody can come up with a better number, this is what I'm using. And I talk about ingredients, not just API, but the chemical intermediates. And this was confirmed by um, those who work in the Indian industry. But again, we're all learning together here. And if anybody has you know, even better information that we can inform policymakers and all of us so we can make good decisions, I, we, I think we have an opportunity to all share and learn together. And again, China is moving up the value chain to achieve dominance in generic drug manufacturing. It's part of its Made in China 2025 plan. China doesn't use that term anymore, but the plan hasn't changed. And this just shows uh, the circle of how it's moving up to production of finished drugs from the raw material, chemical intermediates, API, and then finished drugs. Here's some labels of selected generic drugs made in China by its domestic companies. Here's the antibiotic doxycycline. And this comes from the National Library of Medicine, their drug labels that the FDA shares with the National Library of Medicine. The website is called Daily Med. A chemotherapy generics uh, buying from China. Antidepressants birth control pills, Alzheimer's, 
HIV AIDS. This Nevirapine was the first generic medicine made in China by a domestic company and sold here in the US. The other thing that's really helpful to share with policymakers is that, and many people, is realizing the different balance between generics and brand name drugs. We hear a lot about the brand name products, but about 90% of the medicines that we Americans take are generic drugs. And that's where I think we are most um, challenged by and at risk for. You know, I wrote this, uh, this book to ensure that we have a robust interest industry for generations to come. I want our children and grandchildren to be able to work in an industry where they can do research and make products that are essential for life. One of the concerns that I think we have as a country is that our manufacturing base to make generics is collapsing. The API base is collapsing. I asked someone, so how many API manufacturers do we have in the United States, and at least for generics, and it's really quite um, small, but we need to somehow put more fine tuning on what that really means. Who's making APIs? What's their capacity? Here are the top three generic companies and largest by sales, and things are rapidly changing in that market. I've heard from a number of sources that uh, both of the two large generic companies, Teva and Sandoz, that they're considering dropping 50% of their products. Again, we have to take what we're hearing out in the marketplace to really understanding what is truly going on in terms of our generic drug supply, not just APIs. And Pfizer announced the opening of its global generic headquarters in Shanghai in May 2019. As a customer of medicines, I'd want to know, so what does that mean for where our medicines will be made in five years? And these are the other generic drug companies, a slide that remains unfinished. I see this as a puzzle that's with all the knowledge that we have in the field, we need to put all the pieces together. These are much smaller players, as you can see, compared to the the prior ones. And this is just a prediction and meant to stimulate interest. I predict in five to 10 years, most generic drug manufacturing will be gone from the US unless we act. We have to ask ourselves, is that a good situation? Do we want to ensure we have some capacity to make generic drugs? And if so, which ones are high priority? And if it's not us, how do we ensure a diversified manufacturing base? This is clearly a national security imperative. If you think about it, whoever controls medicines, you control the world. Food has been used as a weapon of war, World War I and World War II, and medicines can certainly be used as leverage in a time of war or just in a time of, of geopolitics. Even India is concerned about the leverage China has over it in controlling the source of its chemical intermediates to make it the APIs it uses for its very large generic industry. China's dominance is indeed global. This is a, a Dutch public television documentary, which if you want to see it, I think it'd be really fascinating to understand the impact of this around the world. This aired in February. <laughs> And this is Chris Oldenhoff, who worked at in the European Fine Chemicals Group for many years and is now retired. And the message is, Europe is as dependent on China as is the US. And a quote from the documentary, now we're afraid that China will do things to deprive us of our medication. And this is, is not a country that's in a trade kerfuffle with China. It's all about the leverage. The good news is uh, NBC Nightly News did a very uh, good story on the impact of the centralization of our global supply chain in a single country. The US China, China Economic and Security Review Commission had a landmark hearing on July 31st of this year. And the Department of Defense uh, testified. This is uh, Mr. Christopher Priest from DHA, the Defense Health 
uh, authority. And Mr. Priest said, quote, the national security risks of increased Chinese dominance of the global active pharmaceutical ingredient market cannot be overstated. Because our military and our veterans are dependent, just as all of us are, because the supply chains are similar. One of the most remarkable events at this hearing was one of the commissioners himself. This is uh, Dr. Larry Wurzel. He's a 32-year veteran, worked, was an Army colonel. He worked uh, at the Army War College, at the Strategic Studies Institute. And here's what he was prompted to say during the hearing. My blood pressure medications were contaminated with rocket fuel. He had three of his blood pressure medicines recalled. I imagine active people had the same problem. This affects the readiness of our troops. So this is what's coming out now. And it's very challenging to hear. But as I learned from writing the Wall of Silence book on medical mistakes years ago, we can't begin to fix a problem until we talk about it even if what we talk about is uncomfortable and unpleasant to hear. At the same time, the good news is people are popping up with ideas on how we can fix it. And that's exactly what we need to do and what we will do. And I believe by working together, we can make a difference on this. Some say, well, if we change the supply of our medicines, costs will go up. So my response to that during the hearing was, we wouldn't have our aircraft carriers and nuclear submarines built in China. And for very important medications, we should look at what it takes to purchase based on value, not just price. One of the remarkable findings was uh, from the 2001 anthrax attacks. In fact, the anniversary of that is on tomorrow, the 18th of September. And my understanding is that from media reports and talking to Guy Vilax at Hovion, that when the federal government needed to buy 20 million doses of doxycycline, they bought it from Hovion, and Hovion had to get the starting material from a plant in China. And now we're seeing, since then, China's now making generic doxycycline for the U.S. market. What the sales are of uh, Chinese generic drugs, I don't know. I think they're still small. But the reality is that they appear to be moving up. And their stated aim is to become the pharmacy to the world. But in doing that, we don't want to have a centralized global supply. We really need for it to be diversified. I've come to the regrettable conclusion that despite the best efforts, the FDA and EU regulators cannot assure quality medicines. And this came from uh, a European Medicines Agency statement in 2012, which is really quite remarkable. They acknowledge that in some cases, defective medicines had to be left on the market to prevent shortages of life-saving medicines, as there's no available alternative. I want to help our regulatory agencies so they don't have to make these terrible choices. There shouldn't have to be interim acceptable limits for carcinogens in medicines. And continuing with what the EMA said, in some cases of non-compliance with good manufacturing practices, the ability of regulators to take action against a manufacturing site was restricted in order to avoid product shortages. Again, the terrible choice. This was a, a, a an inspection report by a European regulator about a Piptazo plant located in China. It failed GMP, but the product was still allowed to be sold because of concerns about a shortage. This is why we need to diversify our manufacturing base, because we don't want to have substandard medicines on our pharmacy shelves. There's a reason, and, and I said to uh, uh, Susan here a few moments ago when I had the opportunity to visit USP and I looked at the history of the thousands and thousands of people over the years that created the standards for what medicine should be. We have to honor that work and do whatever we can to ensure that products are made to meet those standards. Patient safety matters. This is what happens when 
our standards are not enforced. This is a Dr. This is Dr. Robert Allen with his son Joshua in beautiful Arizona taking a hike. Dr. Allen is a 46-year-old Johns Hopkins trained physician. And what, late one night, he walked into the Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale. He knew he had a stomach ulcer that he self-diagnosed, and it was hurting. So it was time to come in and, and have someone take a look. So it was late at night. They kept him overnight. And in the morning, he got several doses of heparin. Later in the morning, he got two bolus doses of heparin. And within 11 minutes, he went into cardiogenic shock and all of his other organs began to fail. That's documented, in fact, in legal documents and medical records. A week later, Dr. Allen's heart was removed. He was put on an artificial heart machine, waiting for his body to try to recover and hoping for a transplant. This was in December 2007, and in January 2008, he's sitting in the bed in Mayo Hospital with his wife next to him watching the evening news, and he hears about contaminated heparin being discovered in the St. Louis Hospital. Being a physician, he turns to his wife and he said, oh my God, I got a lot of heparin. Was it contaminated? And that was the subject of a 10-year-later court case that his wife brought, who's a physician. And her case was the only one that made it from the class action cases in federal court where the judge approved that one case for a jury trial. And that's, in my view, because she's a physician and she understood the medicine. She could read the medical records. She could understand the legal arguments. Her father was a former prosecutor. And her question was, so if it wasn't the heparin, what was it? What's the explanation for my health, otherwise healthy 46-year-old husband to succumb like this in very unusual circumstances? He unfortunately died two months later, a rather horrific death. This is why our standards matter. This is why all the people in the professions work so hard to create those standards. And now we need to live up to those standards to ensure that products are manufactured as they should be. I'd like to go through a couple of recommendations. These are just ideas I have to toss out, and then we'll open it up for questions and a dialogue, because I'd really love to hear what you think and what do you think we should do, what's your experience. I'm really intrigued by the Valisher. This is an online pharmacy on the Yale Science Campus, and they test everything before they send it out. They test three batches of each product, and they find variations. They found that more than 10% of what they've tested don't meet standards, and what they test for is uh, primarily the active ingredient, the inactive ingredients, and dissolution. This is a certificate of analysis that, analysis that comes with a Valisher product. And what I love about this, and I think I caught it at the bottom of the COA, is it's signed by the person who did the testing. So you have a point of accountability that somebody is putting their name on the line, saying, I tested this and it's a medicine that meets standard. That is certainly very reassuring. This was for a Valsartan product. And I think if we had more of this kind of testing, it would begin to change the market very, very quickly and raise expectations among the public and also among manufacturers that the other way simply will not stand. I've been calling for a whole of government review of where we are vulnerable, to assess those vulnerabilities in terms of our global our supply chain for medicine, and to make recommendations to ensure resilience and an unfettered supply of quality medicines. I got this idea from the Defense Department, which was asked two years ago to do what was called a defense industrial-based report. Here's new language, industrial-based. What's industrial-based? It means our, you know, our infrastructure, say, to make generic antibiotics, the fermentation plants. That's industrial-based. So the DOD did that for its industrial base and found that a lot of the components in the equipment that it uses, like night vision goggles, 
there's a certain component of that that comes only from China. The fuel and uh, for certain um, equipment that the military uses, a component only comes from China. So the, what we're seeing with the global supply chain is not just for medicines, but it's really across so many different products, including for our national security. And the value of a whole of government review is that we would all learn together. A lot of people would get up to speed on our vulnerabilities and we'll begin talking about, well, what should we be doing and coming to consensus. Again, I think independent product testing, every batch and public reporting of the results. And again, I love to see the name of someone attached to that. I think that could really be helpful in sending a signal to the market. And finally, we might want to think about targeted federal incentives to diversify the manufacturing base. We have to ask the question, is there some, are there some products for which we absolutely need some degree of domestic production capability? And if so, what would that look like? I'm intrigued by the, the continuous manufacturing technology that is still at a pilot stage. I went down and visited uh, Virginia Commonwealth University on their biotech campus. They are making a, a thousand pills of ciprofloxacin in my lay language, in a box, in a lab, in 24 hours, with continuous quality control. How do we take that technology to scale, commercial scale? So I will stop there. I appreciate your interest in China RX. I want to be clear that I took no money from anybody to do this. No one paid me to do it. I did it because I care. And we donate proceeds to good causes. So I hope you'll share it with friends and colleagues. This is for all of us, for all of our health, the health of people we care about, for our country and truly for the world. And that's my email address and I hope you won't hesitate to reach out. So I'm going to stop there and we'll have some time for questions. And again, since we are broadcasting this on Facebook, we ask you to use a microphone. And not just questions, but comments and reactions and your ideas on what we need to do. So. And you, you want to say your name, that would be great. And if you want to stand up so we can see you. Dr. Gibson, thank you for your lecture. I'm Michael Hogue, um, a member of the APHA Board of Trustees. <clears throat> there are so many directions that your um, research and that your uh, investigation could really take us in terms of uh, America's pharmacists and which, which directions we could go in from a policy standpoint. Uh, it's hard to know where to start with all of that. So I'm wondering if you could, thinking about the nation's pharmacists and, and the American Pharmacists Association, if there were one really critical area, policy area, that we needed to focus on, what, what would you say the one most important or most critical thing would be? I think the first place to start, and thank you, Mike, for that great question and for your leadership here at APHA, I think the first place to start is just knowing where our medicines come from and what does that mean. And I think by doing that, it explains, it can help explain why we have shortages. I'm not satisfied with, oh, well, there's a problem at the plant or we can't get the materials. I think we need to go really understand the root causes. So on the front lines, they'll have deeper knowledge. And when you're at the bedside, when you're at the front lines, that's where innovation and ideas and solutions come from. And we need to hear from pharmacists about what policy should look like. So I think it's important before we begin to think about policy directions, we just need a, a broad-based understanding of it, of where our medicines are coming from. One of the recommendations in China RX is a rethink about our medicines. I think particularly for generics, they've been viewed as a commodity to, to be purchased on the global market at the lowest possible price. I say we're buying our generics like we buy t-shirts. And is that really the right, the way we should be doing it? I can tell if a t-shirt is no good and I can go to a, a shopping mall here this weekend and look for the cheapest possible t-shirt. And I can find it 
And even if I go store to store to store to save, you know, 25 cents, I can do that. And I'll bring it home and it might last, you know, a few washings in the washing machine, but then what? Then I have to go buy another one. We need a different mindset about our medicines to view them as a strategic asset. Like we do food. Like we do oil and energy supplies. These are medicines. This is, these can make the difference between life and death. We're talking about medicines to treat superbugs. We're talking about last resort antibiotics. So I think we need a little rethink about the beauty of what it is that medicines are and to treat them with the respect that they deserve and how we buy them and how we view them. And I think this notion of hammering down on price we want to have affordability. But if you hammer down too hard on price paid to people making things, it's going to break. That's why quality is broken. That's why we're seeing what we're seeing. So we, I think we have to respect this manufacturing process and what it takes to make high quality medicines. So I'd love to hear your thoughts too. Rosemary Hay Brad Tice, Board of Trustees, current president. Uh, have you, it's been great to see uh, the, such as the uh, forum uh, on policy that you mentioned on July 31st, some of the new, the NBC report, some of the others that have come out there. Do you see uh, momentum from that? Do you see follow up from that policy committee or a review on the 31st? Or do we expect anything more to come from that yet? Uh, yes, Brad. Uh, in uh, the Washington Post last week, there was uh, an op-ed written by the, interestingly, the chair of the House Intelligence Committee and the chair of the House uh, Ways and Means Health Subcommittee. And in that op-ed, they describe the national security implications of our pharmaceutical supply chain. And that was clearly informed by the events at the, at the China Commission. And in that op-ed, the two authors described how they will be holding joint hearings on Capitol Hill in the next couple of months. So I'm really delighted to say that this has gotten the attention of, of people here in Washington and certainly people around the country. I think it's a good thing. I think it's also fascinating that the national security angle is one that has really helped propel this. And I would add that, uh, just so you you may already know this, but for others in the room, uh, this is a policy topic for our House of Delegates uh, this Wonderful. year and will be addressed at next year's House of Delegates. Wonderful. Well, we need good ideas. And you on the front lines and in your uh, work around the country, um, this is what we need. We How do we solve this? And it won't be any one solution. It will be multiple solutions at the national level and elsewhere. And I have confidence that, uh, we can begin to fix this. It took us 25 years to get in this situation, so we have to be patient. There is no silver bullet. We have to be patient uh, and come up with really wise ideas for the good of our um, supply of medicines and what's on our pharmacy shelves. Thank you for your lecture. It's, it was wonderful and, and eye-opening. I'm Nikki Hilliard. I'm also on the Board of Trustees. My question also is, um, in your research, what other areas of um, cartels, as you call them, uh, were developing in China? I know the steel industry is one that we've heard of, of course, the pharmaceutical industry. What, what other areas is China also building this dominance? That's a great question. I, I think we could put rare earths in that category where you undersell based on price. Um, and uh, I think it's, it's, it's the general playbook. It's how you take out global industries. And that's why I use the penicillin cartel and vitamin C cartel with the data uh, just to illustrate that. So I think it's really the, the MO, the modus operandi, for really disrupting and dominating entire global industries. That's why when you go into the big box stores or a lot of other places, so much is, uh, is being made in a single country because of that cartel strategy. Thank you for the question. Following up on that question, one thing we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of Chinese companies start to manufacture in the United States, and what effect will that have? Well, I'd love to hear from you. Tell me more about what you're seeing, and tell us who you are, too. 
not a pharmacist, but uh, I'm Joe Hill. You're not a pharmacist, but I uh, an engineer and I mainly design industrial facilities. And we're seeing in the South, we're seeing a lot of Chinese companies come in, make investments. We're seeing uh, a lot of right now is mainly uh, clothing. I see. Are you seeing any uh, medicine related investments? Not here. Okay. Not here. Not, not, not in our area. Oh, there's uh, no question that uh, direct investment in the United States in many different sectors is, is taking place. Look at the purchase of Smithfield, which is the largest uh, pork processor in the world, a venerable Virginia company. And one of the uh, things to think about there is we know that pigs are a source of pig intestines, which is the raw material from which heparin comes from. One of the recommendations I put out just for conversation at the U.S.-China Commission is there's a, a group called the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, and they review the, the security implications of foreign investment in different industries. To give you an example of what they did recently, uh, there's a group, Patients Like Me, which is where people share their data about their you know, chronic health conditions. It turns out there was a Chinese investor that had a significant sh sh ownership share in that company. The Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States reviewed it and said that Chinese investor needs to sell its share. So one of the proposals I put out there is that the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States needs to review the purchase of Smithfield, not for food security, but national health security, so we can ensure that the 15 million hogs that are processed every year, that those pig intestines are be, can be used for production of heparin for the United States. Because right now, we don't know where that goes. And just about that purchase, it's fascinating, this was a $7 billion company. And the Bank of China lent the company $4 billion in a 24-hour overnight loan. So th what's happening is that companies are not just competing with Chinese companies, they're competing with the Chinese government. And that's what makes it challenging for companies in any industry to be able to succeed when they're um, dealing with a very different uh, competitor in the marketplace. But thank you for your question. We need to, need to be looking at a lot of things. Mary, thank you so much. I'm Tom Menigan with APHA. Um, uh, was met you a year, year and a half ago and was have been fascinated with uh, many of the findings in your book. Uh, the, the story of chicken is fascinating. I mean, you think about chicken nuggets and where they've been. Uh, chicken that, that's, that grew up here in the U.S. finds its way to and from China before it's on our plates. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute for those that didn't capture that because it has really great implications on the regulatory side, what's happening there, but go ahead. I'm gonna throw up some softballs and then, so chicken is- And one then the hit one, okay, um, <laughs> and then the big one. This is not a new topic in terms of uh, national strategic interests. Uh, the federal government has bounced this around internally uh, for some time. I'd be curious about your knowledge of, you know, digging in a little bit on the regulatory side, what they're thinking. Um, the, uh, the startups in China, that produce these things are different than startups here in the U.S. in terms of how they're funded. Uh, you didn't say much about that, ask you to uh, unpack that a bit. Uh, and then the FDA is not allowed unannounced inspections in, in China the way they are here. It's, it's expected that U.S. manufacturers uh, can, can count on the FDA showing up at any time uh, but it's very different in part because of the law law cases. Uh, I think there's someone in this room who was involved with FDA work in 2008 uh, related to uh, unannounced inspections and the spool up by FDA to be able to, to better police the world market and how they've been challenged to do that. So you might talk about those things a bit. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tom. There is an unlevel regulatory playing field for manufacturers, as you say. Uh, here in the U.S., as you know, the FDA can walk in, is that right, Susan, just any time and say we're here, whereas uh, plants in other countries, because it is another country, there has to be informing them and permission officially to enter. 
and time can pass during which a lot of things can take place during um, before an inspection. That's why hospital inspections by the Joint Commission, they used to be announced, but now they're unannounced. So uh, that is, speaks to the unlevel regulatory playing field. That said, I've been thinking a lot about can we inspect our way to quality given the current situation? And I, I think the other challenge we need to face is looking at centralization of the global supply in a single country. Let's assume we could have perfect A-plus inspections in China or any other country. Do we want to have so much of our supply of medicines coming from one single country? Do we need to diversify? So that's a, they're not mutually exclusive. So I think that's something to think about, this whole notion of supply chain. Because I want to enable the, F, the good people at the FDA to be able to do the job that they want to do to ensure quality, safe medicines. I'll talk about chicken. You're right, I included a chapter in chicken in China RX. I began to learn how um, there was a debate here in Washington about imp by the US companies sending chicken to China to be processed there into chicken nuggets or strips and to sent back here to the US. Apparently doing that would be more cost effective than processing it here. There was, that was an interim step and that was approved. But I, uh, there's a wonderful gentleman at Food and Water Watch, Tony Corbo, who's been tracking this assiduously. I saw him a few months ago and he said so far there really hasn't been much brought into the country of chicken raised here in the US, processed in China, and then sold back here. But China's original aim was to sell us chicken raised in China, processed there, and sold here. Think how that would devastate the poultry farmers who are among the most, their economic situation is, is very, very challenging. What was the thing that stopped China from sending chickens raised in China, processed there and sold here? Thank God for avian flu. That's what saved our chicken industry. But how would it be done cheaper? And this is back to the regulatory imbalance. US companies invested in chicken processing facilities in China. And there you can process at least twice as many chickens per hour than you can here in the US, according to USDA rules. So they could do it faster and cheaper. And in many ways, that's the modus operandi for so much of the outsourcing. But that, my understanding is that has not, we have not, or you're not getting chicken raised in China and sold here, and US chicken processed in China and sold here. There's been very little, very modest amounts. But the interesting thing from a regulatory point of view is that USDA inspectors would not be in those plants in China. US consumers would have to rely on Chinese regulators to ensure the safety of our food. That's a game changer. And I would also want us to think about what's the long-term picture for FDA to be able to do its job in a country like China. I can imagine that down the road, China could ask for mutual a mutual recognition agreement, saying we're, as it grows bigger and supplies even more of our market and develops its, its capability in its industry and its regulatory capacity, that they, they will have tremendous leverage. I can imagine them saying to the US, well, we can do it ourselves. Give us a mutual recognition agreement. Because it's all about leverage. It's really quite fascinating to see how you know, at high levels of the US government, there were requests to the Chinese government to allow visas for FDA employees hired to work in China. 
and China was refusing to give visas for FDA employees. And what did we, did, what did we do? We still kept buying and we're buying more. So we have to think about using our leverage and ensure we can have our standards be enforced in any country. And when you, your supply chain is so dependent on a single country, you lose leverage. You lose leverage not just in terms of market share, but in uh, regulatory um, oversight. So, thank you. Oh. Yeah, okay, we'll do one final question, and this is from the Facebook Live. Um, so this question is from Lisa Cavella Scholes. Um, the question is, when we look at national security, our food supply has always been considered. There is a seed registry to regrow our farms. Is there something similar for drugs and the APIs we would need should we have to reproduce, reproduce drugs in the U.S. again? Uh, thank you, Lisa, for that question. It's a really great question, brilliant. These are the kinds of questions we should be asking and talking about. One of the creative ideas that I've heard is uh, there's um, uh, good people talking about what if we use continuous flow process to make API here in the United States with incredible technology to create a library of API to stockpile it so it can be used. And my understanding is, I'm not an expert, but I hear from the experts that the API lasts longer than the finished drugs. So what if we created stockpiles of API in the United States for essential medicines? What do we think of that? So thank you for the question. That's exactly the kind of thinking that we need. So I think that ends our Facebook um, show today. <laughs> Thank you all for coming, but don't go because we're going to follow up with just one or two things uh, before we end this morning. So thank you all for coming and thank you for the reward.